here the title a little bit is a little bit misleading because there are generation of VH, there are classical antibodies and nanoantibodies. So, <laughs> so cancer, we are working on cancer. Cancer is still a rather mysterious disease. I have taken this cartoon for a Scientific American 2004 explaining six so-called diabolic superpowers of cancer. Uh, when all these stages are overcome, we come to the final lethal disease, and this lethal disease is a problem. So in the first step, uh, as you see, uh, most cells uh, wait for external message to grow, to, to expand and to grow. Cancer cells avoid this, and they can grow without special external messages. Then when the tumor grows, it squeezes the surrounding tissue, and surrounding tissue sends the messages, stop. But some cancer cells start to overcome these, these, these messages and grow, grow, grow. So they also can evade the autodestructive mechanisms. Uh, normally the cells, where well, they are impaired too much, they go to apoptosis or they go to the forms where our immune system starts to recognize them and to, 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 uh, to evade them from the system. Then uh, it's one hypothesis that at each moment you have thousands of micro tumors in our body uh, starting, uh, trying to grow. That's one of the dark hypotheses. I don't know whether it's true. But uh, it never happens because uh, these micro tumors uh, cannot be supplied with appropriate amount of nutrition and appropriate amount of oxygen. But some cancer cells start uh, to, 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 to trigger the mechanism of vascularization so the tumor can grow. And then um, we have uh, approximately seven times uh, of each cell division in our body. Some cells divide more, more times, some less, but it's uh, approximately seven times because our telomeres are shortened, and when they are shortened too much, uh, that they can uh, start to impair uh, vital positions, uh, the cells die. Some cancer cells uh, revitalize this system of immortalization, telomeric system, and they are immor immortalized. And then the sixth superpower is, of course, when they evade the neighboring tissue and go starts to be metastasing. The problem is that the cancer is, uh, um, is a sequential disease. It's so-called uh, is a, a cl cloned disease. We have uh, thousands of billions of cells in our, our body. And if one, by chance, happens an event uh, that gives to these cells uh, advantage for growth, this, this cell grows quicker, but nothing dramatically happens. It's still controlled by the neighboring tissue. But it divides more often than the normal cells. And its genome is open, so it can, one of these cells of this clone, can be affected by a second mutation. Uh, normally such cells die, but maybe some cell obtain another advantage in growth and you can get a subclone. And so sequentially to the last little phase. There are several hypotheses of cancer roots. Uh, about there are two the, the most uh, classical ones, oh, sorry. The most classical ones, uh, this one is based on the mutations of tumor suppressor genes and, tu and oncogenes. You know, oncogenes, they are normally producing, they are so-called proto-oncogenes, our growth factors, our <coughs> signature machinery in the cell body. And if they are overexpressed or is, if the product is uh, overactive, you can have a stimulus for, for growth in the cells. There are another set of genes, so-called suppressor, suppressor genes, uh, suppressor proteins, which, which control these events, which control tumor suppressor protein, tumor on, uh, oncoproteins, or even expression of oncogenes. This theory was corrected a little bit by the presence of some repair genes at uh, the beginning that they <coughs> detect the malformations in genes, and then uh, they don't allow to pass the mutations to the next generation of cells. And there came this dramatic third hypothesis that all the story starts for an fluidity. That there are some master genes that, that control uh, cell division and appropriate distribution of chromosomes. And if these master genes are impaired, 
the control is wrong, so you can get a wrong number of chromosomes or broken chromosomes or chimeric chromosomes. Normally cells die, uh, die after such an event, but again, some cell may get a growth advantage, and when it starts to grow in clonal expansion, then comes this sequence of oncogene mutations and suppressor mutation. And the last hypothesis is this one, that there are no uh, master genes, that these are random events. If that is so, we can forget that by molecular biology we will, we will correct something uh, we can do individually, but generally not. We must start to think just how to find tools to kill as much as possible such cells. Maybe things are not so dark because we have familiar forms of cancer and uh, this here is not a hope, but <laughs> the hope for science that there is some pattern, there is some logistic in the cancer development. There were uh, more than 100 genes discovered uh, which are more or less uh, associated with different forms of cancer. Uh, but the scientific community was frustrated. Uh, we can uh, link these genes in the pathways of oncogenes, suppressor genes, make such a nice rail railway system. To, uh, and of course, it's good because on the basis of such a, a map, we can do some diagnostic procedures, some predictions, uh, but not enough. The scientific community was frustrated because we didn't find some general uh, pattern of genes to be applied in the majority of forms of cancer to really reveal the roots of cancer. The big hope came with functional genomics. Eh? Functional genomics uh, is after the genome was discovered. Um, it's a science which not anymore is looking for a particular gene for a particular protein or a set of genes and proteins, but considers the cells as a system of simultaneous molecular events and their communication. And that's on the basis of, of transcription of proteins and of metabolites. Here I have such a picture of Paris. Now it's a little bit naive presentation. It's like a photographer comes uh, to the town at 8 o'clock and makes the photo. And that's the physiological state of the cell Paris in the normal, normal physiological state. And then it comes at, let us say, 4 o'clock, 5 o'clock in the morning in this, from the same position as the picture, and that's the pathological states of the cell Paris. And then overlapping of both photos will maybe reveal you uh, where are these crossings which are uh, guilty for the passage from the, pathological, from the normal to pathological step. Of course, real scientist is not doing in such a way. He, he makes a print every minute, and three years he's doing this. And then uh, people uh, called bioinformaticists are joining all these informations, uh, digesting these informations and giving this information to us that we can understand. Eh? That is the basic principle. And uh, we are working with microarrays. And um, uh, the need uh, to discover m better and uh, protein markers in the field of uh, oncology is persisting and is ever growing. So our idea was to use antibodies uh, to, to fish the uh, cancer biomarkers from the system. Uh, the project was designed in such a way. It was very simple design. Uh, the aim of research was identification of new markers, which would discover precancerous legions and also uh, advanced steps of cancer and uh, would give some advice to the medical doctor on the basis of, of, of our results. So the first step was construction of a recombinant antibody library, then of course screening and selection of specific antibodies, isolation, with antibodies of cancer markers from the, from the system, and then with proteomic tools, identification, and then, if good markers identified, to construct a more useful, easy tool for medical diagnostic laboratory. In this instance, it was a protein microarray. Uh, 
just a little brief look to the, uh, to the antibodies. These are classical antibodies. You know, they are composed of two heavy chains and two light chains. And here, what is interesting are high pair variable domains. And uh, in, in research, in medicine, we are normally using or entirely, entirely this, this domain or just uh, high hyper variable domain. And if linked together, we call them single chain antibodies. Um, our aim was so to, uh, to, um, to immunize, immunize uh, the animal, then collect the blood, isolate lymphocytes, extract messenger RNA, this RT-PCR transformed to more stable cDNA, and then to clone it via phage display and then produce variable domains. That was a very simple flow chart. And the animal of selection was llama. Now we are asking us why just llama. Uh, llama is producing classical <laughs> antibodies, but also so-called so heavy chain antibodies, which are lacking this CH1 domain in the heavy chain and also the light chain, because here in the disease domain, there are uh, um, residues which are responsible for this, uh, this, this association. Um, uh, on the molecular basis, uh, in the development of these heavy chain antibodies, it is just uh, one mutation or several mutations that, uh, that uh, skip this association. So uh, in the development, mutation of antibodies this part is lost, and this part is also lost. So normally, llama or camels produce about half and half uh, of heavy chain antibodies and half of the normal or classical antibodies. Uh, it depends largely on the type of animal, uh, also on the environmental conditions, also of the type of, uh, of the antigen. So this proportion uh, migrates uh, from up and down. There are also sharks, uh, which can produce some forms of heavy chain antibodies, but they are not very appropriate for, for research purposes. Uh, why why these uh, single uh, chain antibodies were so interesting for us? They have small size. If we are looking uh, to others, they are much larger. Uh, they can be very good expressed in E. coli. They are soluble and stable, and they are very high temperature resistant. You can manipulate with them up to 90 degrees, and then denaturation occurs, but it can be renaturated. They behave a little bit like poly TAC polymerase in, in, in this aspect. So they are very stable, so very appropriate to construct diagnostic tools with them. And they have all, still high specific, specificity and affinity, and as I mentioned, they are simple to handle. They are, again, explained what I have just told you. Uh, especially this, the last item is very important, that they have close homology to human VH fragments. Um, um, here, uh, I have this cartoon to point you about the size of the antibody. The entire antibody is about 150 to 160 kilodaltons. These regions, which are normally employed in biotechnology, um, uh, are have variation of from 50, 60 kilodaltons to 30 kilodaltons. But our, our uh, just this hypervariable domain of the heavy chain antibodies has just 15 kilodaltons. What is very important, they are very small, and they are able to penetrate uh, blood, uh, blood barrier and uh, also gastric barrier. So some. There are some reports that they could be even used per or, per, for per oral application in immunotherapy. I don't know if that's true, but there were some reports. So um, uh, there is structural representation. Uh, you, you see here human uh, VH uh, variable domain and camelid uh, heavy chain variable domain. So they are very, very similar. So appropriate to use in the human medicine in this instance. Uh, here, I, can, I would like to show you uh, this uh, uh, epitope, which is uh, on the surface. Uh, and this is VH. It's composed on four frameworks. 
and uh, three CDR3 complementary determining regions, which are responsible for recognizing the antigens and for binding the antigens. And each of these have a special uh, hallmark. Uh, you have four amino acids which are conserved in the classical antibodies, and on this heavy chain you have different. You have here uh, less polar amino acids, and here you have more polar amino acids, and you have here a selection of various combinations between them. And later on I will show you that the combination of these amino acids can predict you the length of this CDR3 domain, which is important because it covers the hydrophobic uh, framework of the antibody. In the, um, so, uh, how we proceeded with the experiment? We immunized llamas with uh, our uh, model disease was gastric cancer. Uh, gastric cancer, why? It's a very mysterious disease, very heterogeneous uh, according to histology and to the molecular pathway. Very, very heterogeneous. Uh, cancer, of course, is also a very individual disease, but I can tell you uh, for the scientists to find something, uh, gastric cancer is quite a nightmare, and therefore it was, uh, it was a big challenge. Uh, I would just like to point to you that in former time, where we were still more naive than today, and before functional genomics, we said, okay, we will resolve the problem for, with multiplexing, in, uh, multiplexing biomarkers. Eh? And we uh, multiplexed expression of oncogenes, 10, 15 oncogenes, and also nine tumor suppressor genes, and our idea was that we will have some pattern that will be diagnostic. And we then investigated about 150 or 200 patients, and in the number, I don't know, 23, we found a very good correlation of one genotype with a, bad, with a very good survival. We were very happy. But then you go over all patients, you find nothing like that, and then you find in the number 200 exactly the same genotype, but bad survival, you know. So, so it was frustrating. Therefore, uh, we are trying to, to, to find better biomarkers. So immunization was with proteins from human gastric cancer. We had taken from diverse patients from diverse grades of cancer to cover as much as big repertoire of oncoproteins. Uh, immunization was three times over three months. Um, then it was collection of the blood after uh, each immunization. Then isolation of le leukocytes, uh, isolation of messenger RNA, amplification of v VHH specific genes, and uh, then it was uh, linked with biotin, and then it was expressed in E. coli. Uh, then after expression, of antibodies, it was such uh, differential screening uh, with, uh, uh, of these antibodies attached to the microtiter plates and with the, the protein samples colored differentially from normal and from cancer tissue to see which uh, binders were specific. So on the basis of difference, uh, we also checked their binding affinity and then uh, we, we went further to, uh, to pro proteomic studies uh, to, to see for new markers and then uh, which should be based for diagnosis. Uh, I, I'm speaking of the, this heavy chain antibodies. Uh, why? Because all the science in camels and llamas was directed to this direction. Because the classical VH antibodies uh, were very difficult or quite impossible to isolate because they stick together. I mentioned to you before that the framework, hydrophobic framework, is covering the, the hydrophilic CDR3 region. So these antibodies stick together and recombinantly it's a difficult task to produce them. So all the science was oriented to the classical antibodies. But, uh, but uh, accidentally, sometimes in this fraction they have found also classical VH antibodies, but it was considered that they are result from some undesired effects, from some cross-linking or uh, I don't know, so they were neglected. Um, 
here again is this difference. And uh, uh, we see that this long domain uh, of, the of this heavy chain antibody is covering a lot of the framework. But we, uh, we post our hy hypothesis, maybe it happens also that it is some subspecies of classical antibodies which has extended CDR3 domain. And th th that is the reason that we can, uh, by, uh, in one experiment, isolate both. Eh? And why the classical VH antibodies are so interested? Because they have higher affinity, higher specificity uh, than these heavy chain, uh, ch heavy chain channel antibodies. Uh, conventional approach, uh, they wanted to avoid, eh, to, to, to skip off the classical antibodies. was such that they amplified uh, from messenger RNA, uh, they amplified the fragment from the CH2 region to the uh, framework 1 region in the hypervariable domain. <coughs> And of course, because a classical antibody has this in between CH1 domain, the fragment was every time longer. Eh? And then with nested PCR, they uh, produced the desired VH VHEH antibodies. That was a classical approach. Uh, oops, sorry. Uh, with our approach, we uh, utilized the common primers uh, here was a cocktail of primers covering uh, these hypervariable domains, but also framework four domains. And we got a population of unique antibodies, which were considered as VHH. But later on, we discovered that uh, about 50% of them were also VH antibodies with this approach. What was, uh, what was surprising. So the whole procedure uh, of planning was that this uh, recombinant, we construct a recombinant library with phage display, uh, that is phage production, and then it was followed by affinity selection on immobilized antigens. Uh, immobilized, uh, that, that means that uh, tumor protein extract, uh, protein from t uh, extract, uh, which was used for immunization, was immobilized, and then was washing, no specific were washed out, and then specific binders were eluted, and then they were reamplified, and we performed several cycles. With this reamplification, you enrich the pool of your antibodies. You don't lose in your repertoire some uh, minorly expressed antibodies, uh, so you can cover as much as possible. Um, I'm sorry, I have this sequential presentation. I didn't like to want to do this. So uh, it was normally uh, this Nix Lama library phage displays was first uh, bound to the column with uh, tumor antigens. Then uh, they were eluted and washed through the column of the normal antigens to really obtain the specific ones. And that, that there were several rounds performed in this way. And um, um, we checked the success of this story uh, with also known antigens. Uh, we, we tried to cover several events in cancer, proliferation, apoptosis, angiogenesis, tumor migration, and tumor growth. In, in fact, uh, for three of them, we found very specific VH classical antibodies. That was a big surprise. We expected that we will see heavy chain antibodies, but in fact, they were very specific VH antibodies. But we discovered with extended CDR3 region. This extended CDR3 region. Um, then uh, it was back selection. Eh? Um, uh, I will just go. Then, uh, we bound the phages to the column, and then we, uh, we went to this column with uh, our antigens, with extract, with uh, which we immunized lama before. Eh? And in the, this way, differentially, normal tumor, we identified about 156 differentially expressed proteins, uh, some from gastric and some from liver cancers. Uh, and after enrichment, uh, uh, we and, um, 
uh, after a selection which was based also on literature screening, we uh, finished on 52 gastric proteins in search of liver proteins, and we selected from them 25 proteins as relevant for the further study. Further study means validation. They were validated, all these 25 uh, with uh, immunohistochemistry, but we want also to validate them. Now this is in progress, this work also with tissue arrays uh, in different stages of cancer, and also to see whether they are relevant as uh, blood markers, because for diagnostic uh, purposes, uh, it would be uh, of big, bigger value, you know. Uh, there, some of them are mentioned here. Uh, I will not go into detail. And uh, for what they can be used, eh? if you find one really good validated biomarker which is new, eh? which is new, some of them I, I, I have pointed you uh, were already reported in some other forms of forms of cancer, but not yet in the gastric cancer. But some some are quite new. If you find after validation with immunohistochemistry and with tissue arrays and uh, in different stages of cancer, if you see that can be predictive or something, then you can go to two different directions in the further study. One is to find uh, molecules that will control this marker or control one of the partners of this marker. So you go with the partner to the no uh, signaling pathways and if you can uh, make a position of some such a marker near or, or to one. Uh, you have also uh, preceding studies, protein-protein association studies. So you can uh, go uh, through, uh, through, through small molecular search, docking, uh, first bioinformatics search, then go through the library of small molecules and found, find some molecules that will trigger or stop whatever <coughs> you want. Such. If you don't, if such a molecule is not druggable, you may, you may look to some other partner because with your protein you discover a pathway. Eh? And pathway discovery is very important in cancer because uh, uh, as I mentioned, it's quite individual disease and it's not necessarily that in each uh, the same cancer, uh, if the same password, uh, uh, pathway affected, uh, the same player is involved in it. Um, the next uh, direction is clustering of your information. Uh, here I have a picture of two patients. Uh, it's a little bit naive picture. Um, um, from our pool of 25 markers, we have looked uh, similarly expressed in gastric and in normal tissue. And you construct clusters and you have two patients and you have uh, similarly expressed uh, proteins which are quite, quite close. So the, the, it seems that the experiment was quite well done. And in the tumor tissue, another set of genes was similarly expressed, and they are quite apart. And from the form of the cancer, which is histologically very similar, you found a very different molecular pathway. Of course, that is maybe one finding, but then you must go to uh, hundreds of patients and see if that is a law. And if you find that you have found really something useful, you, can, you, you have prediction eh, for, for, for the development of the disease. Uh, sorry. So uh, here I have the case of uh, diffuse large B-cell lymphoma. Uh, just to show you uh, very efficient clustering in the disease of three patients which is uh, histologically uh, uh, quite equal. So uh, they clustered genes over or under expressed in the gene families. And here are the questions. Now you can put the question male or female, over 50, under 50, and so on. Good, good hierarchy of questions. And you obtain for three patients quite different pictures. Eh? And if you see that it is um, in correlation with your therapeutic intervention, then you have all, good, all, uh, all tools in your hand which uh, can provide you with good diagnosis and good follow-up of the patient. Eh? Uh, this I will skip a little bit. Uh, I'm sorry because I, the time is running. But I will maybe at the end return back. So, 
Uh, as I mentioned at the beginning, our aim was to construct a protein microarray eh, with our antibodies, which are very sol which are soluble at one point, at the other point, very robust and uh, suffering high temperatures, changes in environmental conditions. So we said, okay, we can do a chip which could be useful also in diagnostic laboratory. Normally, chips are produced so that you bind. Um, uh, antibody, uh, that if antigen binds, you must have a secondary antibody and, and, uh, uh, and a procedure to see what is happening. Uh, in our way, we selected this method just uh, to attach antibodies on the surface of a chip and then screen what happens with some different procedure. One could be uh, with differentially colored uh, 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 extracts of, from tumor and normal tissue, but we selected another way, which was on plasma surface imagery. imagery. That means that on the, that is a glass prism, that's the gold surface. We attach, uh, uh, we, uh, we attach uh, uh, molecules uh, of some length, and then some uh, longer aliphats, which can be activated, you see. That these are spaces that the distance is uh, quite enough that the attached antibodies which will not hinder one, one another. So uh, we biotinylated, we activated these residues, then uh, we bound streptavidin to this, and then we expected, <coughs> and then we bound uh, uh, biotinylated antibody on this streptavidin. And in such a way, we obtained quite a robust, uh, robust chip. And we expected this. Eh? When an antigen will bind to the antibody, it will make conformational changes uh, which will affect the plasmon that the electronic flow over the gold surface will affect. And the beam, the declination of beam will, will be altered. Eh? Re reflection will be altered. And in this way, we will also quantitatively see each event. Uh, in the market, they are, um, they are plasma surf surface uh, 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 detectors uh, which can detect four uh, binders at once. But more and more, they are multi-channel. And we were lucky to co work with French people in GFC Rivet, which had such multi-channel. So we were able to produce a chip uh, with several hundreds of uh, different antibodies and try to use them for, uh, to, to, to see a diagnostic signature of a patient. That was the aim. Eh? That was the aim. Unfortunately, it happened after a day or two, it happened such things that your chip at the beginning, it looks quite nice, that's after spotting, but then after use, it is, it is, it is such nice, it's, it's dry, and you cannot use it anymore. So you, you cannot force a medical doctor that in each diagnostic case, he will produce a protein biochip and then make a diagnosis. So uh, uh, now it was the second idea came together with Babrachem Institute of Cambridge, they are authors of the PISA protein situ array uh, technology. So you must, you, you must produce first cDNA chips. So you must sequence your antibodies, and then uh, on the basis of amino acid sequence, you, you construct a cDNA chip, which is stable. You can have cDNA chip on the fridge over months, over a year. And then they have a black box. And the black box is a sponge with in vitro, in vitro transcription and translation system. So when you need a chip, you can directly print from the CDNA chip, you, you, you print your, your protein chip. Uh, the technology is, is looks here, you see. Again, here you have uh, uh, protein tech capture agent. Eh? And then you have your DNA CDNA array you have here. And then the sponge, this membrane, which is soaked with the in vitro translation transcription system and then the newly synthesized uh, protein attacked to the surface of the chip. That looks elegant, uh, but I can say that uh, at this stage uh, we are doing prototype of this. Prototype on the basis of all the known markers I have shown before you, these four and six, and if the prototype will work, we will go further. Eh? We will, we will, uh, in the meantime, we are looking for new protein markers. 
Um, and we are extending this research uh, not just uh, from, uh, for uh, uh, doing ga gastric uh, or intestinal or liver uh, cancer, but now it's neoglioblastoma in the play. And we will go uh, to look for the markers on the surface. And uh, the new idea is uh, to vaccinate llamas not with extracts from tumor cells, but with the whole stem cells, eh, with stone cells, to, to cover the surface markers, the surface markers. Um, this can be uh, of importance to find new markers for diagnosis, but also to produce maybe antibodies uh, which will be useful for therapy, because, you know, glioblastoma is a big problem. It arises from several points in the brain. It's very difficult to be surgically treated. And these small antibodies can go through the blood barrier. They are very small. And because they are very small, uh, we speculate then maybe they can recognize, they will be based on this recognition, they can recognize also the surface proteins which are so affected, so mutated, they are uh, conformationally uh, too small to be recognized by our normal immune system. Eh? And maybe these antibodies will, will be a good, uh, good therapeutic tool. No, that's, that's, that's the main idea of this study. At the end, maybe we will come to this. Eh? I, can, I have shown you these three pictures of three different patients. But with good, good clustering of new biomarkers and good questions here, we will not, not so clear, but we will be able to construct images uh, which will be r r associated with some form of disease. Né? And even us which are working, who are working in the medical school, we will know what is, what is happening. <laughs> so that is, uh, I will thank at the end to my colleagues, this is a colleague of the Medical Center of Molecular Biology, then Gilles Sirivet, Denis Pompon, and Gilles Turin. In Marseille, we did uh, with Daniel Batti immunization of llamas. Now we shifted this uh, because in Ljubljana we have llamas in zoo, but we are not allowed to, to, to do experiments with them. We can just produce naive bank to so take blood and to see if there are some antibodies already existing there. Uh, but in Belgium, now we have in Belgium a group we will do together with them. Uh, in Italy here, we, we have done some proteomic studies of our biomarkers with Alessandro Vindini. And uh, in Barbraham Institute, we are doing this protein microarray. And of course, material comes from the Institute of Oncology in Ljubljana. So I thank you at the end for, for your kind attention.